Hi Sadhguru, welcome to Australia. And um, I have a question. Um, sometimes we get in a situation when we're surrounded by people who is, have a very high expectation to, in terms of us. And um, when we cannot fulfill the expectation, you start to feel a very terrible feeling of guilt. And um, it's okay when it's your mother-in-law, you can kind of go for that. <laughs> but sometimes it's your parents, for example. I, I have no problem. I have nothing against her. I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, sometimes it's the people who's very close to you, like your parents, and you cannot really um, fulfill the expectation because you would like to do in your life what you want to do, and obviously it's not what they want. And um, how to cope with that feeling of guilt, and also what do you think, what kind of relationship should be between the parents and the children? Thank you. Uh, that reminds me of something. See, one thing is, it's not just between parents and children, just about every relationship, everywhere. People have all kinds of weird expectations. <laughs> it's like this, a lady went to the butcher shop and all this chicken, which were hanging upside down, dressed chicken. Poor chicken, feathers are their dress. You rip it off and say they're dressed <laughs> So she went to this chicken and uh, lifted one leg, smelled, wrinkled her nose, lifted a wing, wrinkled her nose. Like this she was going from chicken to chicken. It was having an effect on the rest of the customers. <laughs> so the butcher saw it's having an effect, so he went and tapped on her shoulder. She turned around. So he asked, Ma'am, can you pass a test like that? <laughs> so a whole lot of people are always <laughs> busy <laughs> putting everybody to tests that they themselves cannot pass. Especially parents, pa parents think all the things that they could not do, they must achieve through their children. So they should have bred racehorses <laughs> I want you to understand this, children are not your property. It's… it's a privilege another life came through you, hmm? You must enjoy it. Do your best to nourish it. What it becomes is not your business. Your business is to support it, create a wonderful atmosphere around it, create an ambience where it grows well. I'm using the word it consciously. Like a tree, like a plant, you just create the nourishment that it needs, it grows. Well, is it going to bear apples, pears, mangoes or just flowers or just nothing? We don't know. Only thing is, your wish is they must grow to their full potential. They are not an extension of your ambitions. They are not and they need not be. So this is because people think they own their children. No, they are not your property. I think these days they are telling you, older generation hesitated to say this. This generation, by the time they're ten, they're telling you, you got no business to tell me what to do <laughs> So does it mean to say you don't say anything to them? No, it's your business to see because if you don't guide them, somebody else will on the street or somebody will do it long distance on the internet, all kinds of creatures are out there <laughs> All right. So yes, to protect them, to nourish them, to allow them to explore their possibilities, it is your business to do that as a parent. But parents concern maybe what will happen, what will happen, what will happen. I… my dear father, he is ninety-five, uh, <clears throat> he is a physician. 
In his mind, that generation of Indians will understand that. Unless you become a physician, you're no good. So I was no good <laughs> But that was good for me because when you're no good, nobody pays enough attention. That's all I wanted, <laughs> that they leave me alone <laughs> So I, I'm just saying, you know, he, he's always worried, what will happen to this boy? His concern is this, this boy has no fear in his heart, what will happen? So one day when I was eleven years of age, he said this, you know, I came home with a twelve-foot cobra, he was my friend. And he said, this boy has no fear in his heart, what will happen? Then I asked him, when did fear become a virtue? When did this happen? <laughs> he said, see, I told you he has no fear in his heart. I said, that's fine, but when did fear become a virtue? Why is it like this? Why fear, anger, all these things have become virtues, is it? Tell me when you go through fear, is it fantastic? Hello? It's one of the most terrible emotions you can go through. Why are we thinking that we should be fearful of our future, not only of your future, of anything that you do and you're even God-fearing, all right? Fearful about everything, what is the point? There is no such thing. There is no such thing that this generation should be an extension of the previous generation. This generation should do something that previous ge generation could not imagine. That is when there is a purpose to this generation, isn't it? Otherwise, what's the point if you're going to do the same things? Well, if you want to do something that you really want to do, if you think you're going to do it with everybody's approval, I'm sorry, life doesn't happen that way. It is just that whatever the hell you want to do, just do it well. Once there is success, your parents and your uncles and your aunts, everybody says, wonderful <laughs> all right They want success, they're only afraid. They have every right to be concerned about you. They have every right because they brought you up. They're concerned whether you will do well or not. They have every right to be concerned, but that concern should not become control. What event, decision, experience or period has had the most profound impact on your life? You're asking Matt, right? No, I'm asking you. <laughs> I would like to know, <laughs> please. Oh, this has been spoken of many, many, many times, isn't it? Experience, influence, see this is the only thing I did with my life. I was in the United States uh, and uh, this lady comes up to me and says, I was doing… I've been doing yoga for over thirty-five years, nothing happened to me. You just went and sat on that rock, the, all this happened to you. Where is the damn rock <laughs> <laughs> And now the rock is becoming famous <laughs> Like you know, for Gautama the Buddha, the Bodhi tree became more famous than the Buddha <laughs> I must tell you this experience. <laughs> I was in Coimbatore many years ago, about almost twenty-five, thirty years ago. And uh, I'm… I go to somebody's house for lunch. And uh, this lady says, uh, Sadhguru, I have a Bodhi tree in my backyard. I sit and meditate under that. Can you come and bless my tree? <laughs> I say, please water the tree, I will bless you <laughs> She said, no, 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 you must come and bless the tree. I thought, let me go into the backyard. I am always an outdoor man <laughs> so I walked out. Then I looked around, I did not see any Bodhi tree, there were three coconut trees <laughs> but I did not see any Bodhi tree. Then I asked her, where is the Bodhi tree? Then she takes me to one place, there there is one stick which is about six, seven feet tall with about five leaves 
Under that she's put one stone plate and on which she sits and meditates under the Bodhi tree. I looked at this Bodhi tree and said, see, this Bodhi tree does not have much possibility. If you at least sit under the coconut tree, <laughs> something could happen <laughs> Under coconut tree things happen <laughs> because when you're in this state, what you need is a knock on your head <laughs> So, what is the most significant influence? This is all I did in my life. From early childhood, I did not allow either family, my genetics, my social situations, the religious situation around me, political situations around me, whatever around me, I did not allow myself to be influenced by any of those things. This is why I keep repeating, I am an uneducated guru because I refuse to be educated. To remain uneducated is not easy. <laughs> yes sir, because from the moment you are born, Everybody wants to teach you something that's not worked in their life <laughs> It's a compulsive need in adults the moment they see. You know like uh, I was… When my, my… when my daughter was three and a half months old, I would drive alone with her all across India with my one hand on her, my right leg heavy. This is the time when I'm building Isha Foundation, I'm driving across the country, every day I'm with a new family. Then I noticed everybody is desperate to teach something to her. I said, please, nobody teaches her anything. No ABC, no one, two, three, no Mary had a little lamb. I don't want any of these things. Then people said, Sadhguru, you're not letting anybody teach anything. What will happen to this girl? This girl won't know even how to count her fingers. I said, I don't care if she cannot count her fingers. As long as she knows how to use her fingers, what do I care? She thinks this is a million, what's my problem <laughs> As long as she knows how to use her fingers. So, uh, and I don't care whether Mary had a lamb or not. So, <laughs> I said, nobody teach her anything. Because nobody is teaching her anything. See, it is by constantly looking down on the child, you know what is this, you know what is that? the child feels smaller and smaller and smaller mm. because nobody spoke to her in those terms. She thought everybody is her friends. She is two and a half, three years, she thinks all the adults are her friends, she talks to them like they're her friends. By the time she's eighteen months, she's fluently speaking three languages, very fluently. Because nobody is teaching her anything, her, she's all years listening to everything around her. Well, I wouldn't have sent her to school but uh, you know, my schedules and my travels didn't allow that. So I sent her to a school where there's least amount of schooling. One day she came back from school, she was around thirteen years of age and she was little upset about what happened in the school. Then she comes and tells me, you're teaching everybody so many things, you're not teaching me anything. I said, see, I'm not known to do anything unsolicited. Now that you have come, you sit down, we'll see. I said, see, this is all you need to know. You never look up to anybody. She looked at me like this, what about you kind of look? I said, especially me, because if you look up to me, you will miss it completely. What will you do? Maybe take my picture and nail it on your wall. That's all you will do. You got to see me the way I am. If you see me the way I am, every moment of my life, it will be of great significance to you. If you look up to me, you will exaggerate. Never look up to anybody, never look down on anybody. This is all. Is that all? That is all <laughs> See, if you look up to something, you will make up things in your mind. If you look down on somebody, you will make up nonsense in your head. If you don't do these two things, you will see everything just the way it is. If you see everything just the way it is, you will effortlessly navigate through life. This is all you have to do. Don't worry about what is significant. This is the most significant aspect of my life. I never looked up to anything 
nor look down on anything in my life. I looked at everything just the way it is. This is all you need to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, probably uh, Matt is more loud in India than in Australia. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here, Matt. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. It'd be very easy to uh, listen to Sadhguruji all evening, but unfortunately we are out of time. So on behalf of us all, thank you for gracing you know, our shores. You're a very special human being. Tell me, what should I tell the Tamil boys? You can tell them from me that I'll be back in business with them very shortly. That's what you can tell them. Surfing, about the water, cooking. What, what about the water? About the water? Yeah, what they should do, the Tamil boys. Easy as this. And girls. Spend a little bit of their own money to invest into some trees, and we're all in business, aren't we? Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, Good evening, everyone. If you, Thank you. If you don't know this, if you don't know this, don't tell anybody. I make the best masala dosa in the world. <laughs> well, you can be sure of this, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>